This is the second episode in a multi-part series about N-Hibernate. In this episode, Chad will review how to use the Hibernate configuration file to set up our mappings. Recently released, um, and you can get that at shrinkster, shrinkster.com slash 11vi, 11vi. Um, you just download that and unzip it, and in there you'll find a bunch of files. What you really need are the, <clears throat> excuse me, the binaries, the DLLs. And Hibernate has some dependencies on like Log4Net and the Castle Dynamic proxy. We'll get into what the proxy is for later. Um, so you need to make sure you have all the related DLLs. So one of the neat things that's uh, that comes in the package is uh, a schema. Um, so part of what N Hibernate does is it uses XML to map between your objects and the database. Um, there can be a lot of XML. That's a thing I'll talk about later. There are ways around having to do that, um, but if you're if you're using the XML, you definitely want to drop the schema into your program files. Um, you know, if you're on a 64-bit operating system, this will actually be program files parentheses x86, Microsoft Visual Studio 9 if you're using Visual Studio 2008, and there's an XML folder and there's a schemas folder. If you drop that in there, Visual Studio will now pick this up, and you'll actually get IntelliSense when you're typing your mappings. This is very important because um, it, it helps you to see what options are available and it kind of leads you into learning more about NHibernate. <clears throat> Finally, once you've copied all the DLLs into wherever your reference folder is, if you have a live directory or tools directory or whatever, and then you reference those from Visual Studio, you need to start by adding a reference to nhibernate.dll. Um, and we'll get into what all that means later. So to start with using nhibernate, let's assume that you already have a data model. You already have a database and uh, I have a, a sample one here um, it's real simple it's kinda like a most of this is just contrived but it's an e-commerce application so you have uh, and it's uh, we're, we're hosting e-commerce sites for other people so we have a concept of a store um, which is like our customer and then we have a concept of a customer which is the people buying from the various stores and then um, uh, each customer has a collection of orders that they've they've purchased <clears throat> from that store. So you'll notice here we have um, TB customer, TB order, and TB store. Pretty pretty normal. Um, you know, primary key, first name, last name, created date, and then uh, f you know foreign key to the store ID. And you'll notice we're using kind of, uh, you know, everybody has a different naming convention for the database, but we're using stuff that doesn't look very .NET-ish. So uh, y you'll notice that you can have your columns named just about anything you want and, and hibernate, but you wouldn't want to call your customer object TB customer in your .NET code. Um, so and hibernate can handle the mapping back and forth between those. So what we'll, what we'll want to do actually is in our, um, in our, project in Visual Studio. So you'll notice here I have two projects. I actually have just a quick console application just to illustrate purposes. I don't want to get bogged down in talking about WinForms or uh, ASP.NET. You know, I don't want to blend too many things here, so I'm using the dirt simplest thing I can. And then I have a core library here, which is what will contain all my domain objects. So you notice here I've, cre I've already created, well, let's start with store here. I've already created a store object. And it's just public class store. Notice it doesn't derive from any interfaces. It doesn't have to implement any interfaces. It can if you want. If you have a domain layer super type that you want to derive from that has all this special functionality and or what you know, if you love doing that, that's fine. But you don't have to. And Hibernate does not require it. The only thing in Hibernate does require is that it have a um, <clears throat> a public parameterist per, sorry parameterless stuff to say constructor. Um, there are a few ways around that you can actually tell in Hibernate how to deal with it, but uh, um, it, that's much more complicated, you know, high-level stuff, so or uh, low-level stuff. So I'm going to avoid that for right now. But for for right now, just assume you need to have a parameterless constructor, and then you just have properties on your object like normal. If you want to facilitate lazy loading, which is something we'll talk about, you need to make the properties virtual. This is not a requirement. Uh, or lazy loading is not a requirement, but uh, it does help speed a few things up. So you need to you need to make your properties virtual. This generally isn't that big of a deal. Some people get bent out of shape about it, but you know it's an option you can configure. And Hibernate is extremely configurable. 
And then I just put this, uh, I put a two string method on it just to facilitate our console app so you can see things print out. There's nothing magic there. That's definitely not required by Unhibernate. This is just something I threw in there. And then what you want to do is in order to map the store, you'll actually want to um, you know, right click in your project on a folder and add a new item. And you're going to add an XML document. And you need to call, well, I don't think the file name actually matters. Uh, it's generally customary to call it the same as the class name, so store in this example, .hbm.xml. That's, that's the custom. It doesn't actually have to be that way. Um, and I think in Hibernate we'll figure it out. Uh, but this is generally the custom. So I already have one of those, so I'm not going to actually do it. There's one other thing you need to do. You need to make sure it's an embedded resource. Um, and Hibernate actually has different ways of loading the XML documents. It can load them from the file system. It can load them directly from an XML document in memory, or it can pull them out of your assemblies. Generally, I would say that the majority use case is that people either have them as XML files on the disk, and they, ship, they sit side by side with their compiled assemblies, or they just make them embedded resources. Uh, this is actually one source of frustration I have because um, I'll add mapping documents and then forget to set embedded resources and then uh, compile the app and run it and, and Hibernate says, you know, hey, there's no mapping for such and such class and I'll bang my head and bang my head for 15 minutes and figure, oh, that's right, I forgot to set embedded resources. <laughs> so don't forget that, very important point. <clears throat> so when, when, you, um, when you start out with a, an XML document, it, it's totally empty. So the first root element you need to start with is the nHibernate mapping element. And then what you can do is you, if you type XML NS for XML namespace, Visual Studio will actually come up with the IntelliSense. And uh, if we scroll down here, we'll find it's URN and Hibernate mapping. And if you put that on there, you'll, you'll get a, um, IntelliSense on all your XML which comes in very handy when you're cranking out a lot of these XML documents if you have a very rich domain model. So what I did here is on the Hibernate mapping is all my classes are going to be scoped using from this assembly and this namespace, and Hibernate intro.core, and the namespace is core.domain, and Hibernate intro.core.domain. And then uh, for, for, you know, basic class, you know, uh, class objects to table mapping, you just use the class element. You tell it what the actual object name is, so in this case it's nhibernate intro.core.domain.store and then by default it'll just assume there's a table called store but what we're going to do is we actually don't have a table called store, it's called TB store, so we have to tell in hibernate this is what our table name actually is. Uh, every class has to have an ID uh, by definition, by in hibernate's definition, an entity is, a, is something that has an ID, it has a unique identifier that I can go to the database and say, give me this entity with this ID. There's a lot of different options about how you can make that uh, ID, you know, generally like in SQL Server it would be identity an identity column. In Oracle it's a sequence. Um, you can use uh, GUIDs or UUIDs. You can use the GUID.com algorithm. You can provide your own heck, like a, a Oracle doesn't have a GUID type, or at least the older Oracles don't have a GUID type. So you have to use GUID.hex, which stores it as a, as like a raw binary. Um, there's a lot of different options for how you do the generation. Um, what I usually do is uh, use identity columns. And uh, if you just tell in Hibernate to use native, it will do the right thing depending on what database you're connected to. So if you're on SQL Server, it uses identity. If you're on Oracle, it uses sequence. Um, I'm not sure what it does for MySQL or Postgres, but uh, you know, it, I'm sure it probably does the appropriate thing, whatever that may happen to be. And you also notice here our column names are funky. They don't match. So in .NET, it makes sense to have a store ID. But in, in the database, it's actually pk underscore store underscore ID. We have a very creative DBA who, who names all our columns. So uh, that allows us to keep our, our .NET domain very clean, um, but yet still respect the naming conventions that are already in the database. And then we have two properties, name and accounting code. Um, and we specify the columns, because the column names, and then the lengths. And then we can tell in Hibernate that these are not null. We don't actually have to tell in Hibernate that. 
um, because SQL, if we try to set null on a non-null non field, uh, SQL Server will throw the error. But uh, And Hibernate can actually catch these things before it goes to the database and wastes around trip to the database. It'll tell you right up front. It'll throw an exception um, and uh, not let you get to that point. Same thing with the string lengths. Um, I'm, you may have heard that uh, <clears throat> the string or binary data would be truncated. You may have gotten that error before from SQL Server, and Hibernate can help you um, cut off some of those errors. You'll still get an error, but it'll be slightly more descriptive about what exactly, what, what which column it was that it was trying to truncate. <clears throat>